Welcome to Sarder TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton. Today I have the honor of talking with Ramona Pearson, the co-founder and CEO of Declara. Ramona, welcome and thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now you have overcome absolutely tremendous challenges in your life. Can you please share with our viewers the story of how everything changed for you at the tender age of 22? Sure, you know, um, it's, it's a long story, but when I was a young person, I was in the Marine Corps and I was um, uh, I, one of the most physically fit Marines, so I was always running. I ran uh, marathons for them and usually had a daily routine of about 13 miles a day. And uh, one day I went out for a run and at the same time, I was crossing a street, a drunk driver uh, ran through a red light, um, had hit me, uh, my left foot got caught up in the wheel well and spun that leg around and ran over my right foot and then uh, the bumper had damaged my, my throat and uh, I suffered from blunt chest trauma. I woke up 18 months later from a coma and um, the only thing that I could remember was feeling like a grenade had gone off in my head and um, you know, feeling my life's blood leaving me. So when I woke up, I was just confused as to what happened. Uh, had no idea it was 18 months later. So you can imagine how shocking it would be to, to sort of come back into the world and not be able to see, not be able to speak, and not be able to walk. And uh, so my journey began from there. So you had to relearn everything um, and you had very little support system at the time. What was that like? What did you learn from relearning everything? You know, um, first of all, I've learned the lesson of being a lifelong learner. I've also learned, um, it was interesting because probably the best thing that happened to me was having the hospital give up on me and push me into a senior citizen's home because when I, I uh, landed there, all of a sudden I found myself with like 100 grandparents <laughs> and they only had me to focus on. So they, imagine that personalized learning. So it wasn't like a computer was personalizing things for me. It was each person every second of the day was trying to figure out what my needs were, how to walk, how to speak, how to cook, how to be independent again. And, um, you know, and, and so I learned a lot of things that I've incorporated into the company, like gamification. So the senior citizen man decided to make my life of relearning to speak fun, so they taught me cuss word scrapple. So <laughs> you, you, you could imagine what my first words were. <laughs> and how shocking that might have been to the community, the senior citizen women, when I started cussing like a sailor. But um, then the women also really enjoyed, uh, you know, putting a lot of attention around me, but they also had to invent ways of helping a blind person. So at that time, I was completely blind, and, um, you know, they had no knowledge of how to teach me braille or how to navigate or use a cane, but they made it up. And so after falling and bumps and bruises, they kind of figured it out, I kind of figured it out. And uh, one of the biggest difficulties I had besides learning to speak again was actually learning to cross streets again. And so before Mark Zuckerberg came up with uh, move fast and break things, the senior citizen women taught me that, and that was when I came up to a curb, stick the cane out, and if it got hit by a car, don't cross the street. So <laughs> after breaking a tons of canes, I, uh, they decided that they needed to send me to the Braille Institute to figure this whole thing out. So um, my lifelong learning journey, learning journey started at that time, and uh, it taught me a lot of lessons about innovation and being uh, a learner. I want to go back for a second. You said the hospital gave up on you. 
um, why did the hospital give up? And ha was that, in a sense, almost a, a good thing? Because you, got, you ended up learning so much from these people who cared for you so much? You know, um, it was a good thing. Hospitals are, are in place to actually help you in a time of trauma or in a time of need. And what had happened was I just wasn't uh, thriving. And so they figured that my life was going to sunset because their job isn't to rehabilitate you and really get you on the feet. It's about saving your life and, and getting you to the point where you can leave. And so I think that, um, you know, sometimes in the movies you see people come out of comas, get up and walk out with their families, but that's not how it happens. It, it takes a very long time to come to your senses fully as well. So um, I, when they gave up on me, it was essentially saying they didn't know if I was going to survive. So I ended up in the senior citizen's home and because these folks, people believed their lives were sunsetting and so they thought my life would sunset with them. but you know, as their lives were sunsetting, the irony was their sunset gave me my sunrise. And um, their dedication and love for me uh, had brought me back. And I, you know, there are no people left there, but I now live my life uh, dedicated to paying it forward in other ways, trying to bring lifelong learning to the world because I was given life back because of these senior citizens. To what do you attribute your extraordinary resiliency, your ability to just keep moving forward and thrive in a way that most people just simply wouldn't be able to? You know, I think one of the biggest things that I learned was, um, at first it was almost a coping mechanism. If When I came out of the, co the coma, you know, I it felt like I, I couldn't grab the memory. So every time I tried to get the memory of what happened, it was like reaching for a glass of water and from behind bars, and the water was always just out of my reach. So there was an essence of a memory, but I could not bring it back. So then um, it kept bothering me, and what I realized is I needed to turn my focus forward because I wasn't going to grasp that memory. And when I shifted my focus into learning and trying to get back on my path, and at that time I had to go, okay, what? I don't even know what my path was supposed to be. Before my accident, I wanted to be a cardiologist, but I didn't realize that for several years later, which is weird, but... Um, mm. It took, it's taken me, you know, many years to piece together my life again, but um, when I started having a forward-facing goals to try to achieve, I'd do it in, I just need to live six months and accomplish these things. And then I'd think, I just need to live two years and accomplish these other things. So, and then I thought, if I can make it through four years, you know, so then I started creating four-year chunks, finish college, go to graduate school, start racing bikes, start, uh, you know, I just started doing different things and and trying to get my mind back first, then my body back, and um, now I've built both of those uh, disciplines into my life and always looking forward and always being goal-seeking instead of looking back because if you look back, uh, people ask me, well, don't you want to go get even with this guy or do mm. anything? But then that takes you back into a backward facing momentum instead of keeping forward facing where I can actually be a contributor in, in a productive human being in this life instead of somebody who's bitter. And now you're changing the world. D did you ever speak to the man? No, you know, I, it took me so long. I, I didn't speak for almost four years, so it took me a long time to learn to really speak. And by then, I, I had so many other things, goals and other things that were coming uh, in my life. And then, um, you know, when I got my sight back, and so many years, oh my gosh, you know, I was back in 1984, it's 
it's hard to even imagine thinking about going back in time around that. Well, your mathematical mind, which is extraordinary, and your athletic ability really set you on a very unique path, starting as a Marine, doing top secret work with algorithms, which sounds fascinating. Tell us a little bit about your career journey and what you've done. Yeah, you know, when I, when I joined the service, it's funny because um, I really wanted to have an exciting adventure, run through the jungle with my M16, but, you know, I ended up in a little boring dark room. So it wasn't as sexy, you know, <laughs> algorithms are sexy now, but they weren't so sexy then. So, so it's interesting how time has changed and life has changed. And, um, and you know, over time, really being uh, a curious learner has opened up my world in so many ways and, and also lacking fear. So having, uh, uh, being driven by curiosity and risk taking and when opportunities knock walking through every door because when you start turning away from opportunities those doors close and so every time somebody said hey blind girl you want to go rock climbing I'd go yes <laughs> and I'd jump into that adventure that experience or um, moving and going to colleges and people were concerned that as a blind person, how, was, how would I adjust to different places? I went on to uh, race tandem bikes in Russia and throughout Europe, and people didn't know how I was going to survive all of those things. But, but they became opportunities that opened up other doors. And um, as those doors opened, it created opportunity for me to have brain surgery and, and a cornea transplant so I could get my left eye back. And, because I went to Russia and met the right people and who had been working and developing in this uh, in new technology. So, wow. Wow. so my, the other piece is I have been um, the recipient of so many innovations and uh, beginning when my life was saved out on the street. Somebody used a big pen, put it through my throat, which is a nice little scar, but by doing that he brought in the airway into my life. And so the simple innovation of a big pen used in a different way was in incredible and has allowed me to be here today. And then a doctor being willing to not follow the FDA regulations and pack me in ice and reduce my body temperature, save my brain and um, you know, my left leg, somebody was going to cut it off, and a young doctor, Christopher Cox, I owe that gentleman my leg, uh, at California Pacific, he realized that I needed a certain type of metal instead of bone transplants. And so along the way, you know, now I'm sort of cyborgish, so um, different pieces and parts of me are metal. Someday when I die, they'll just melt me down and turn me into a titanium <laughs> bike. But, uh, but I've had the good fortune of bringing together the innovations that I've been willing to take, the risks I've been able to take in my careers, and, and just having adventures in life. How do you think, or what are some examples, I guess, of how you've turned your challenges into opportunities to help others? It's interesting as, you know, and I'm going to pitch Declara, but go to declara.com. It's an example. It's interesting because um, what I have learned is that as I, as I just jump in, like when I started to learn to rock climb, uh, rock climbing for a blind person is like giant braille. You know, you're, <laughs> you get to braille the rock and scale up the rocks, but the problem was uh, it would make me illiterate because it would uh, uh, create calluses on my fingers and then ah. I wouldn't be able to bra read Braille. But anyway, when I would do that, all of a sudden people would learn to take the risks. Like friends of mine who would come to watch me do that, they'd go, well, if the blind girl can do it, I can do it. Mm. And Or when I started this business and I talked to women about... Um, finding mentors to help you get funding because mentors can help you be your critical friend to give you the objective eye on the things that you think about and the things you're planning 
and really help drive you to be that better person, to maximize your potential. And our, um, so I've modeled how we've built our consumer product around that. So as I'm learning, the community learns. So we use insights as you're reading and you find things and you insight things, the whole community learns along with you. So in different areas, whether it's neuroscience or you know, cooking or whatever your passion is. And I brought that forward because of a lot of the work that was happening in, in my personal life, that we are teachers as we are learners. Speaking of mentors, what role have mentors played in your career? And have there been a couple that stand out in particular? Oh, absolutely. So the first mentor um, is Naomi Hoops. She's uh, almost about 90 years old. And, uh, you know, I met her because uh, my guide dog, I was blind at the time, and she was a janitor at the college, and she had seen me fall into a, like a mud slough ditch. My dog slipped off a trail because I decided to go uh, hiking. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we slid, and I was like in this thing. I couldn't get out, so I was trying to get my guide dog up. And I, at that time, I was only, when I came out of the hospital, I was 68 pounds. And when I had my guide dog, I was about 78 pounds, 80 pounds. And she was 100, so I couldn't get her out of this sludge. So all of a sudden, this powerful woman grabbed the dog and grabbed me out of there and then cleaned me up. And she wanted to know why it was crazy and as a blind girl hiking around <laughs> in the backwoods. But anyway, she, um, what she taught me was the beauty of friendship. And as a blind person, in my whole life, I, you know, because I was always so focused on uh, learning and math and being a geek um, or being an athlete, I didn't spend a lot of time, you know, interacting with people. And she gave me the guidance to learn how to be a friend and how to be how to be a how to be a woman, an adult woman. And um, what I've learned is that all young women need adult women to mentor them for so many reasons beyond the professional reasons, but just for life's reasons. Number two, I, um, Deborah Shripati, our chief operating officer and my partner, um, we, meeting her was amazing and she's been a mentor because she's been a known leader. So she was the CTO for the National Basketball Association, uh, CIO and president of E-Trade, senior, or, uh, uh, corporate vice president for Microsoft, incredible professional leader and mentor of many people, became my mentor as well in, in uh, leadership and mentoring others. And um, also there are uh, my uh, venture capitalists, Matt Ocko and Mark Flynn and Paul Ning have been incredible mentors in helping me really understand um, how to raise money and to um, build companies and to take risks and to really understand the long tail of building a company around a platform and not just building an app to flip it to Facebook or Google, but to really, really build a great product to change the world. What advice do you give young people who are coming out of school, entering the business world, wanting to rise to the top? To be entrepreneurial. So, you know, young people need to see themselves as, uh, regardless of what their role is, as leaders. So, and as they're leading, even in their entry level jobs, they are actually teaching others who are coming up behind them and to carry themselves as that entrepreneur, to see themselves internally as the CEO of their world. And then that way they're bringing autonomy and leadership into their team and decision making. So the world that we need today, 21st century learning in our jobs is having the flexibility to be lifelong learners because your job's going to change 
every day, every week, every year, and nobody sits in a job for 25 years now. So you have to have that cognitive flexibility and you have to have that internal drive to, to be that leader, to be a learning leader for your teams and to um, model how to be a person in a company and in your life. What makes a great leader? Um, I think two things, empathy and learning. Um, I, empathy because you have to be able to, to see the needs of your team, to really intuit it and to understand when they, they need the bars held high because when we lower the bar and lower our expectations, it means that we don't believe in our team and we're not just making it easy for them to succeed, we're actually helping them fail. But if you create the bars high and you help them exceed their, their own expectations, then you have succeeded as a leader. And, and all of us should hold each other to that higher bar and hold each other accountable. And I think the only way we can do that well is if we can intuit and have that empathy for the people we work with. Now, you have this crazy ability <laughs> to solve and visualize these complex equations in your head, uh, which is so rare. How did this gift inform the idea you had for Declara? You know, it's, it's hard because it's interesting. You know, my last company, I was about three years ahead of myself, and that was painful because when I told people, you know, all the data is going to be stored in the cloud, everybody in the, everybody I'd talk to would go, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I'm not going to give you my data. And right. I was just like, it's coming. You're going to have to. But, you know, it's, it's hard to be that person who can see behind the corner, right? So, and then tell each other people who can't see around the corner what's around the corner because, it's hard for them to visualize that. So the hardest thing for me is understanding and being able to see what's coming around the corner and being able to describe what's around the corner for people who can't envision that. So like rep reptiles can see two dimensionally. So when the hand comes around a lizard to pick it up, they don't know where that hand came from because they can't imagine that third dimension. So. Now imagine trying to describe certain things like the iPhone to somebody back in the 1700s. They'd think you were crazy. So, uh, or even to my grandparents. They right, would. I was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just even to my parents who aren't here. But, you know, the whole concept of the iPhone is, is such a revolution and has changed business and and the world of the commercial business forever. So um, there are so many things that are coming and I see that they're coming. It's just hard to help people and scaffold them so that they're comfortable with what's coming. Um, for instance, like I've been in my own collections on and reading what people are learning and there are folks from MIT and Stanford collaborating together about brain to computer interactions and neuro um, mesh where in mesh is being injected into the brain and and someday having human to human internet so i mean these guys are even building things that are way out maybe not too far out in the future but they're further out in the future than even i'm developing in so it's it's interesting to see how the future is being created today and it's happening faster than we could have ever imagined. So tell us about the mission of Declara. How is it different from other business-centric ne networks? Yeah, so we have, um, we have our enterprise uh, product which is in the country of Mexico, um, the country of Australia and Puerto Rico. Um, and in Genentech, which helps people uh, be able to learn and maximize their potential under, you know, the understanding of um, the goals set by these countries or the organizations that have bought that product. But our consumer product is really around helping people maximize their potential um, 
you know, globally. And my belief is that knowledge should be open and free. And so what makes this product really amazing is that uh, people, you know, knowledge workers spend about 30% of their time searching, collecting URLs, putting them in their emails, and then forwarding them and trying to get their teams to learn from all these URLs being sent out. Like I used to do that for my product team. Now with Declara, I just uh, use our browser extension. I can pull in all of these uh, uh, articles, PDFs, videos, and create a collection and have everybody get on it. But what we believe is that people really want the bytes of information. So we, we help create the insights so that you can speed read on your, your uh, iWatch and learn anything around neuroscience or whatever area that you're trying to learn be able to share it out and as you're learning something you're sharing it actually in our community and uh, soon you'll have video insights where you'll be able to look at an hour and a half um, uh, lecture or an hour and a half video and be able to take the four minutes or the little clips out of it that are important to you and share those out so that you can speed watch so what we've come up with is something like um, combining the next generation Twitter with the next generation Facebook with the next generation Google all together so that um, you know you can collaborate and learn with your friends. Now you also have a master's in education and at one point you partnered with the Department of Veterans Affairs to study how well returning soldiers were learning skills. What did you find in the classrooms and why did you see it as a data problem? So it, it's a big story. So I was uh, working at the VA, um, uh, you know, in the, around post-traumatic stress disorder and learning and memory because both of those, learning and memory and post-traumatic stress disorder sort of uh, Overlay, have a overlay. Um, so I was very interested in um, learning and memory and I decided to go visit a classroom in South um, San Francisco to see how people were assessing kids and I realized I wanted to really understand education and so as a neuroscientist I was like you know I I can't make a judgment about education unless I become deep in the problem set. So I went back to school, USF, and got my master's in education so that I could have the voice of the educator instead of being an objective uh, discriminator of education. And so after really getting deep in education, I took um, the Alliance for Education, gave me a, a fellowship to move up to Seattle so I worked under a Gates grant um, to really try to understand education. So I took all the data from every classroom across 120 schools, 50,000 students, and 10,000 teachers and built a program called The Source. So the kids called it The Source and because it became the source of the data for everyone. So I could actually see all the learning needs of the kids and it also became a way for me to make the data transparent to the kids and when I did that then the kids started realizing that they could own their data and that they could be empowered around their own learning needs which inspired kids to really drive harder and when parents saw that data it transformed their communication with their own kids and st they started holding them accountable for attending classes which um, you know, they couldn't lie anymore, the kids. They couldn't uh. say, ah, because <laughs> the parents could log in and see whether the kids went to class or not. Get anyway, busted quickly. quickly. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I started a company called Synaptic Mash where I brought the cognitive and neurosciences in, and we used algorithms to personalize learning. And what I learned was um, we were in the state of Indiana and we took all the gap kids, the kids that uh, had not advanced in math for three years. And um, what we did was change their schedule to be matched with teachers who 
preferred teaching either in large classrooms, small classrooms, project-based learning or whatever in the modality in which kids learn best. And so we flipped the idea of the classroom upside down, really, not just talked about it, but really did it. And then we took all the content from McGraw-Hill and basically digitized it and, and blew up pedagogy and basically took the learning progressions of kids and matched them to the right teachers, to the right content at the right time. And these kids caught up to their age peers in six weeks. And oh, wow. Wow. the silver bullet wasn't the algorithm. It was actually helping kids get unhooked from believing that they weren't learners. So when they saw that they were learners, they started interacting with school differently, their teachers differently, and themselves and their families differently, and became excited about school. Now, the learning I had there was two years later, um, we teachers told me that they had run through all of the content and curriculum and that now what do you do if you've accelerated learning and kids are two years ahead <laughs> and can be in, co in college? So it too disruptive for the school system and now you have to rethink how do you rethink the entire political, geopolitical education system. Mm. So that's why this hasn't rolled out across the country because it sounds like such a good solution is that what has held it back? It's too disruptive for sort of Very the disruptive curriculum. programs like that because then, you know, we are, we advance kids chronologically and our entire education system is built around having so many teachers and so many places and having kids move that way, not around, not moving kids around their competencies, right? We have kids adjust to education instead of education adjusting to kids. So it would mean really a sh huge shift in how content's bought, how we teach teachers, and how we build uh, curriculum programs. It's huge, huge issue. So, um, yeah, so then Declara, when I rolled out our um, our platform, we started with educators because in countries where they're trying to transform their entire workforce and uh, now that we're rolling out our consumer product, we're trying to really build it around um, the individual and not about institutions. And do you think there's, there's ever a chance for this to make an impact in the U.S.? It, what do you think is the future of education? Clearly, we can't keep going like we are, and clearly, there are brilliant solutions being developed. Where do you see it going? So, I feel like Declare is ushering in sort of the Web 3.0, where it's around ubiquitous learning. So, we can't wait for the systems to fix themselves. We have to have platforms like, like Declara where people can come in and really drive their own learning needs and drive their intent and interest around learning, be able to plug into learning anytime and on any device and connect with experts and see, I call it the naked brain, but and my team hates that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to see uh, what experts in the fields of physics or the experts in the fields of neuroscience or math are being recommended to read. And imagine the power of that, to be able to join a learning journey of somebody else and, and to have those kinds of, of mentors, different kinds of mentors around your own personal interests. So what we're trying to do is bring ubiquitous, ubiquitous learning to, to the world. What are some of the biggest skill gaps that you see out in the workforce today? Um, you know, some of the biggest ones that I've encountered and what I hear in every country is that when our our students are graduating from school, we have so much concentrated on helping them learn how to take tests and we teach to the tests that when they graduate and they come into the workforce, they're waiting for someone to define what their job is and give them a spreadsheet of do this, do this, do yeah. this. 
and that they're not really self, um, they're not able to actually see the problem set and innovate right. and come up with solutions and to be autonomous thinkers. And so by doing the thinking for people, we're sort of under valuing their own cognitive creativity and entrepreneurial uh, sense of self. And so how do we bring that back into our, our millennials, into the people who are going to replace me yeah. in my job? And um, it scares me a little. So how do we bring those skills back in where people become thinkers? And I think we're going to have to rethink what we're doing in higher ed and help our our young people really understand how to how to synthesize, analyze, and to make better judgment and to really uh, take risks and innovate. You you were talking about the source earlier, and I'm curious because, as you also mentioned earlier, people don't keep the same jobs forever. People change jobs rapidly. Our skill sets need to change. Um, how did you move into designing and developing software to solve problems? How, how, do, how have you personally sort of navigated moving into different industries? You know, um, being a lifelong learner, so, uh, and it's a funny story, but I, um, when I ended up in a school district, Seattle Public Schools, I, came in and um, I had just had almost, you know, they had to replace my tibia, so I had to sit in the hospital for a while. So I decided I'm going to teach myself how to code. So then I... It's <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Yeah, so I bought all these programs and started teaching myself. And then I started to teach myself software architecture. and. Um, then when I was working at, at Seattle and my first um, task was really to rethink things and also I took a risk and did everything they told me not to do. Mm -hmm. So the school district didn't want me to roll out the system to the whole district. They didn't want me to make data transparent to the kids and so I was able to get a small team and I to work all night, every night for a long time, and we just rolled it out um, because sometimes you have to you have to do the right thing, and uh, and by doing that, now the source is still there. And it was funny; some two mothers just skyped me, and they said, "Thank you for the source because it's still it's still running autonomously." <laughs> and is it just doing, in Indiana, or no? It's in Seattle. Seattle. And, yeah, it's in Seattle Public Schools, just still running. I keep expecting them to replace it after all these years, but what the heck. <laughs> so, uh, you know. It's amazing. <laughs> it's like its own robot now. So uh, it just keeps running. Anyway, um, you know, uh, and then in Declara, sometimes you have to just take these risks. And, you know, our enterprise... Uh, product was doing really well and everybody was going, why do you want to get into the consumer side? Well, uh, declare our core beliefs are uh, around being passionate, be true, and do the impossible. And I wasn't being true to the company or to um, the people we serve if I didn't have a consumer product because we w our vision is to change how the world learns and so it meant if I was going to be true, I had to uh, take this risk and build out a consumer product and launch it so that I would be true to our original vision. How does Declara's technology itself learn? <laughs> I know that's probably very complex, but t tell us a little about that. It's so interesting. Yeah, you know, um, first I modeled it after a seeing eye dog. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my seeing eye dog, Annie, um, so I had her for 10 years. And when you first get a guide dog, they come out. And Annie had a 2,700-word vocabulary from her training. But she was super strict 
every time I did something wrong, she'd nip my knee or punish me. And uh, so what was interesting is that, um, like I would tell her, okay, go find the bathroom. Well, she wouldn't distinguish the men's or women's restroom. So I can tell you I've spent some time on a men's urinal trying to figure out how to make it work. <laughs> and, and then, um, uh, you know, I'd tell her to go find people and instead of finding them in the classroom or in their offices, she'd go track them down. And sometimes it would be, you know, outside, in their car or at the bathroom. So she was just very specific, but over time she learned from me. So following my behaviors, she started to be able to predict what my needs were. So she'd go, okay, every Tuesday and Thursday I go to the grocery store. So then she would just take me there and I wouldn't have to tell her to do wow. that. She would find the bus stop for me. She, she just nailed my schedule. And then periodically she would have something I call transformative uh, analysis of what she thought would transform my world. So she knew I liked adventures, so sometimes she'd surprise me with adventures. Or she would override my commands because she would think she knew better than me. Wow. 90% of the time she was right, and that used to always make me mad. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's amazing having a dog that's smarter than you are. But the key was, as I learn, she learned, and uh, she became better than me at thinking about some of these things. So what Declara does is we have three different types of recommendations. The recommendations of similarity, like Netflix, oh, some people are, are learning this and you're sim trying to do that, so maybe you should follow what they're reading. Then there's the predictive of well, you're doing this and this and this in the product, perhaps you need to read these things or connect with these people. And then transformative is coming. So in the next few weeks, we're going to launch something called the learning profile so that you can see your depth of engagement and your breadth of influence on the community so that you can keep continuing to drive transformation of the people who are following you. and. Uh, find people you want to learn from. So, so anyway, I learned all of this from my guide dog, and now we're employing it into the product. We touched on this earlier, so let me ask you, is there more you want to say about how teachers are using Declara? Yeah, you know, and it's, it's interesting, and we don't play it out very well. Like, we don't talk about it very much because we're um, a humble company. But um, one of the things that we have done in Mexico, you know, Mexico, the, the head of the teachers' union was arrested for various things. But one of the things that the teachers weren't getting was professional development and their, their right to lifelong learning and getting the professional development they need to really help their, their citizens, their kids, their future resource of the country. And so Mexico has been doing amazingly well without having the, the biggest potential opportunity in their country, which, are, which is wrapped around education, which is important for innovation. So companies can't do well if you don't have kids that are coming out innovative to help drive transformation in business and e-commerce. So, so anyway, um, when they brought in our platform for educators, they first did it just to evaluate, okay, get teachers on, um, help train them, get the, the training that they were supposed to have that, that was robbed from them. And uh, so what they found out was all the teachers um, all the teachers that were on our product outperformed the teachers that weren't on the national assessment in Mexico. So now they're moving beyond that assessment and helping these teachers to maximize their potential. So what I've been seeing is that we've turned on the social learning piece. The teachers, after they're uh, taking their courses and everything, doing their structured learning, are now staying and doing informal learning with each other. And every minute they're spinning up a new learning network on our, on our uh, enterprise network. And they are 
are teaching each other and it's just growing like a Facebook for teachers in Mexico. Really? And it's delightful to see that the educators are moving above and beyond what the country's um, expectations were. And you know, 20 years from now, when we look back, we'll be able to see that we helped to transform the entire learning structure and community in Mexico. And that's something to be super proud of. What is your number one piece of advice for how to learn throughout life in the face of obstacles and setbacks? Um, the best way is, you know, I, I have one of my personal beliefs is um, to always feel that you're empty. If you're empty, then you're willing to be filled. So that was a Buddhist belief that I just uh, pulled in there. But it was something that I realized is the moment that I think I'm an, I know everything there is, then I close the door to learning anything new. Mm. And what I am learning in... Uh, on the Declara platform from our community is I realize I, I know nothing because people are learning so much and they're teaching me as they're learning and it's even transforming me and it's that willingness to be that, that lifelong learner and curiosity that you have to, if you have a curious mind you know, uh, Einstein said the measurement of true intelligence wasn't their education, it was the curiosity and imagination. And so you have to have your core knowledge to be able to build your foundations from. So education's great for that. But I believe that curiosity allows you to uncap your potential and to really maximize who you could potentially be. And to be a lifelong learner, you need mentors and help you, while you are being guided by others, you're guiding others. Ramona, thank you so very much for being with us today and spending this time illuminating us with your experience and your knowledge. Uh, we just appreciate it so much. Oh, thank you. This was such a fun interview. I really appreciate it and uh, thank you so much. This is Sarder TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton. We really appreciate you joining us and we'll see you next time.